what a pleasure it is to come back to Princeton this, and have a chance to talk about my favorite subject uh, I, in, a, in a context that I think is very meaningful today. In 1807, John Adams declared that a complete history of the American Revolution could only be written if it included what and let, uh, it can only be written if it included what happened in each state. There's a lot of truth to that assertion, and it makes the idea of celebrating New Jersey's 350th birthday all the more important. The revolution is the central event that gave New Jersey its identity and its pride. For celebrators like us, meeting in Princeton, there's an added dimension to our gathering. We're here to add weight and renew dignity to a protest in the name of New Jersey's proud past and even prouder present. We all know what I'm talking about. Our determination to block the Institute for Advanced Studies plan to desecrate the nearby battlefield where George Washington proved he was a leader of men and rescued the American Revolution from collapse. By looking at New Jersey's role in this world transforming story, I hope we will all see that our current protest is part of a vital tradition something that we can and should renew and renew and renew until the state and the nation joins us. Let's start by noting that in 1776, New Jersey was a state with remarkably contemporary overtones. Unlike New England and the South, where there was little diversity in religion and background, New Jersey had Dutch reform believers in Bergen County and Quakers along the Delaware. Anglicans, better known as Episcopalians today in Elizabethtown, and Presbyterians here in Princeton, Newark, and many other places. The state's inner spirit was already democratic with a small d. Philip Fithian, a young minister, noted with pleasure the way New Jersey gentlemen of the first rank associated freely with the laborious part of men, people who worked with their hands and considered them the strength of the colony. The explanation, Fithian thought, was the near approach to an equality of wealth among the inhabitants. Those words take us to a little understood aspect of the American Revolution. It was not a struggle to give oppressed people their first taste of liberty and equality. These were values that New Jerseyans and Americans had already created in a hundred years of toil and effort and argument. They were not some future hope for the New Jerseyans of 1776. They were defending an already precious heritage against a mother country who had grown arrogant and uncaring. They also knew that if they lost this challenge to London's demand for unquestioning obedience, there would be no limit to the degradation they might face. They knew how ruthlessly the British had suppressed rebellions in Ireland and Scotland. No one put it better than William Livingston, the man who became the revolution's leader in New Jersey. Whoever draws his sword against his prince must throw away the scabbard, he grimly declared. New Jersey was the first state to discover just how serious the British were about suppressing the American rebellion. On July 1st, 1776, militiamen standing guard at Sandy Hook noticed a startling number of ships on the horizon. Within a few hours, a staggering 30,000 soldiers began landing unopposed on Staten Island. Most of today's Americans do not realize what a shock this armada was. It exploded an assumption that had been advanced by Tom Paine in his defiant pamphlet, Common Sense. Along with pungent arguments for America declaring her independence, Paine assured his readers that the British were too bankrupt to send more than five or 6,000 men to America. A large fleet was equally unlikely. London's once dominant navy was rotting at its harbors as the nation struggled to pay off the huge debt it had accumulated while defeating Spain and France in the Seven Years' War. Apparently, none of these people had ever heard of the Bank of England. <laughs> <laughs> this supposed fact enabled Sam Adams and other ideologues in Congress to argue that virtuous Americans, 
fired by their vision of liberty did not need training or knowledge of strategy and tactics. Above all, we did not need that dangerous entity, a large regular army. They forbade George Washington to enlist more than 20,000 men. The rest of America's conquering host would be militia. 30 or 40,000 of these untrained amateur soldiers would overwhelm the relative handful of the king's half-hearted mercenaries in a single battle, what they called in those days a general action. I tell the harrowing outcome of this assumption in my book, 1776, Year of Illusions. That's what it really was. Mm -hmm. The first step toward ridding New Jersey of this ruinously bad idea occurred on the night of July 1st, 1776. Lieutenant Colonel Nathaniel Scudder of Monmouth County, commander of the men who had seen the approach of the gigantic enemy fleet of more than 400 ships, mounted his horse at 11 p.m. and galloped through the darkness to Burlington, where New Jersey's Provincial Congress was meeting. He burst into their deliberations early on July 2nd, thereby staking a claim to be the title, uh, to the title of being New Jersey's Paul Revere. The Provincial Congress rushed the grim news to the Continental Congress at Philadelphia. There, a debate was raging about declaring independence. Colonel Scudder's message made it clear that it would be fraught with peril. That day, the Continental Congress, with New York abstaining, voted to take the plunge and approve Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. On the same July 2nd in Burlington, New Jersey's Provincial Congress voted to approve a constitution, their own version of a Declaration of Independence. But the decision was carried by an unimpressive 26 votes to nine. No less than 30 members of the legislature abstained. A clause in the document stated, if a reconciliation between Great Britain and these colonies should take place, this charter shall be null and void. I think a lot of people in that group were praying that was what was going to happen. For New Jersey, the road to independence was not nearly as clear-cut as it had been for the combative Yankees of Massachusetts. There was no gunfire on Lexington Green, no dead bodies in the ditches along the road from Concord to Boston. The news that April 19th, the, the news of that April 19th, carnage had excited outrage in some New Jerseyans, but it stirred disgust and a substantial number of others who regarded the quarrelsome descendants of the Puritans with suspicion and dislike. New Jersey's attitude was complicated by a royal governor who was an American with a famous name, William Franklin. This handsome, gifted man stunned his father, Benjamin, and many others by deciding to remain loyal to the king. Around Franklin's gubernatorial mansion in Perth Amboy lived a circle of wealthy fellow loyalists known as the Group. They were almost all descendants of the men who had acquired a slice of King Charles II's 1664 grant to the Duke of, New uh, to the Duke of York, which created New Jersey. They owned a million acres of land in New Jersey, which they sold or leased at a pace steady enough to guarantee most of them upper class incomes. With that kind of wealth and William Franklin's popularity and political skills, it was not hard to stir doubts about independence in many New Jersey minds and hearts. Late in 1775, Governor Franklin called an emergency session of the legislature and announced that King George III was ready to grant New Jersey many special favors, such as the right to print paper money, the answer to every debtor's prayer. And believe me, there was a lot of debtors in New Jersey. All the legislators had to do was petition the king for a restoration of peace and harmony. The words would implicitly pledge their allegiance to the crown. The Continental Congress was so alarmed, they rushed three of their best speakers to Burlington. The orators warned that Governor Franklin's proposal would turn the shaky American Union into a rope of sand. The legislators rejected the governor's petition, 
and New Jersey's independence men, recognizing Franklin as a dangerous man, ordered a regiment of militia to arrest him early in 1776. Mm -hmm. Then came Tom Paine's call for Americans to rid themselves of kings and aristocrats. Governor Franklin, under arrest in Connecticut but still in touch with numerous loyalists, reported that common sense had a backlash effect in New Jersey. It opened the eyes of people of sense and property to the real intentions of the Independence Party. To answer Franklin, New Jersey found its own Tom Paine, the Reverend Jacob Green of Hanover, who published a pamphlet declaring reconciliation with London was a vain hope. Alas, Green then echoed Paine's assurances that the British were much too close to bankruptcy to send a large army and fleet to America. The next six sanguinary years would prove Paine and Green inept and very dangerous prophets. <laughs> Meanwhile, some of New Jersey's best soldiers were fighting and dying far from home in the Continental Congress's campaign to add Canada to the American Union. To support this dubious venture, Congress had taken 10,000 of Washington's regulars, reducing the so-called Continental Army to the vanishing point. Poorly supplied and led by amateurish generals from New England, the Americans were routed by a reinforced British Army in the spring of 1776. In their headlong retreat, they died by the hundreds from rampaging smallpox and other fevers that often demoralized armies in the 18th century. This was a real tragedy for New Jersey. They lost the first people that wanted to volunteer, the guys who really wanted to fight. They were dead up there on the Canadian border. In the fall of 1776, Colonel Scudder's July report of the huge fleet and enormous army swelled to nightmare proportions throughout New Jersey. George Washington's Continental Army, now an unstable mix of a majority of militia and a minority of regulars, had been mauled unmercifully in a series of battles around New York. In the first of these clashes, New Jersey's leading soldier, General William Alexander, often called Lord Sterling, because he claimed a, a, royalty, a, a royal uh, title in Scotland, he displayed combat heroism that even the British were forced to admire. With the American army in panicky retreat, Alexander rallied 250, that's, all, that's what I'm saying, 250 Maryland men and led a counterattack against 10,000 oncoming British regulars. The move checked the British long enough to let most of the Americans escape, but only a handful of the brave fellows, as Washington called the Marylanders, survived. In other words, it was not good news. <laughs> With New England's militiamen now deserting by the thousands and the morale of his few regulars sinking, George Washington transformed this struggle in a letter to Congress that discarded Tom Paine's brain-dead theory of an easy victory in one big general action. Washington told Congress that they would henceforth avoid a general action that put everything to the risk, as he put it. Instead, they would protract the war. When I wrote my history of West Point in the 1960s, I talked with many generals. All of them agreed that this drastic change in strategy in the midst of a, the collapse of his army and, and his country, really, proved that Washington was one of the great commanders. He could think, and he didn't lose his head, no matter how bad things looked. It also, this idea <coughs> of protracting the war, turned New Jersey into a crucial battleground for the rest of the war. Leaving two-thirds of his dwindling army in Westchester County to block a possible British lunge into New England, Washington retreated into New Jersey and asked Governor William Livingston to call out the 17,000 militiamen on the state's rolls. Only about 1,000 proponents of independence turned out. Grim evidence of the impact of the British victories in and around New York. <coughs> Washington had only one option, retreat across the Delaware River 
and seemingly seeming abandonment of New Jersey. New England born General William Heath wrote the commander in chief a discouraged letter denouncing New Jersey's lack of patriotism. Washington's reply was as historically important as his decision to protract the war. The defection of the people, he wrote, has been as much owing to the want of an army to look the enemy in the face as to any other cause. A regular army to look the enemy in the face became the other cornerstone of Washington's strategy and the key to New Jersey's survival. A supreme realist, Washington saw that militiamen were too often reluctant soldiers with little or no training. They could not be expected to stand up to the best professional army in the world unless it was a regular <coughs> American army with the same equipment and training to confront the enemy host. Both legs of Washington's strategy remained invisible in the closing weeks of 1776. British reg regiments soon occupied a dozen key towns across the state. With the triumphant enemy battalions <coughs> came a host of loyalists who went to work on turning New Jersey into the first loyal colony. They had signed copies of pardons that Governor William Franklin had smuggled from his prison cell in Connecticut. They were offered to former rebels who promised to remain in peaceable obedience to his majesty. In a few weeks, thousands of intimidated New Jerseyans took this oath and received a promise of protection. On the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware, General Washington saw what was happening. If New Jersey became the first loyal colony, a surge of despair would easily swing Pennsylvania and New York in the same defeatist direction. To contest this slide into surrender, he encouraged General Heath to invade northern New Jersey from the Hudson Highlands and, um, and intimidate the many loyalists who had come out of hiding there. He gave General Alexander McDougall of New York three regiments of regulars to support a good turnout of militia in Morris County. Finally, <coughs> on Christmas night, Washington led his 2,500 regulars across the ice-choked Delaware River to kill or capture two-thirds of the garrison of German troops in Trenton. Ten days later, his ranks bolstered by Pennsylvania militia, Washington recrossed the Delaware outmaneuvered Lord Cornwallis, the British general sent to defeat him, and caught a substantial part of the British army flat-footed here in Princeton. In a brutal face-to-face -face confrontation, he smashed them, and they fled in all directions. From the viewpoint of New Jerseyans, Princeton was a far more important victory than Trenton. It was loaded with historic symbolism, these redcoats were not hired strangers like Trenton's Germans. They were the arrogant, sneering spokesmen of the mother country who, in a moment of victory at the Battle of Harlem Heights in Manhattan, had sounded a fox-hunting bugle to rally their infantrymen. The stunt suggested that the Americans were mere witless animals to be captured or killed without mercy for the greater glory of British imperialism. Washington never forgot that bugle call. He joined in the pursuit of the Redcoats fleeing Princeton, roaring, it's a fine fox hunt, my boys. <laughs> the whole dramatic story of Princeton was soon swirling through New Jersey, giving new hope to thousands of patriot hearts. The shaken Kingsmen evacuated most of the state, except for a small enclave around New Brunswick. Reinvigorated, New Jersey militiamen began shooting up British patrols. Elsewhere, in the words of one disgruntled Briton who was trapped in Virginia, Americans went liberty mad again. The words underscore the enormous importance of Princeton as a turning point in the history of the revolution. From the first loyal state, <coughs> heads hung low in humiliation, New Jersey had been transformed into the symbolic leaders of the revolutionary struggle. For New Jerseyans, that proud achievement did not mean that they could rest on their laurels. For the next five years, an often savage war 
Frequently, a civil war raged in New Jersey. Former Speaker of the New Jersey Assembly, Cortland Skinner, became a British Brigadier General and recruited a regiment of loyalists, the New Jersey Volunteers. Abraham Van Busker of Bergen County became the leader of another all-New Jersey Loyalist Regiment. Best known was the 3rd Regiment, the Queen's Rangers, commanded by British professional soldier John Graves Simcoe, whom millions of TV viewers have learned to hate for his cruelty and arrogance in the weekly drama Turn. I should add here that Tipco was not a nice guy, but he wasn't as bad as they painted. <laughs> Loyalist guerrillas remained active throughout New Jersey. Midnight terrorism became a part of every New Jersey patriot's life, especially along the Eastern Shore. Farms were burned and looted, and patriot leaders were killed or kidnapped to British prisons in New York. Patriots responded with equal savagery against loyalists on Staten Island and within New Jersey's borders. Perhaps the best view of this little recognized struggle are the minutes of Governor Livingston's Council of Safety. Each page is jammed with the names of New Jerseyans who resisted the revolution and were dragged before this semi-judicial body during the war. They received jail sentences, and in some cases, death sentences, for their loyalty to George III. It's not hard to see why the governor became the most hated man in New Jersey. For five years, he seldom slept in the same house more than a single night. Even grimmer was the way the New Jersey Brigade recruited men for the five regiments they had in the Continental Army. They numbered over 2,000 in the pivotal year, 1776 but the figures soon declined to 1,500 and barely 20% of these soldiers were what they called free yeomen, the men that the state legislature had hoped would fight the war. Most were recruited from drifters and landless lower classes. Yeomen were guys, you know, small farmers. When enlistment quotas remained unfilled, Livingston's Council of Safety began offering arrested loyalists a choice between the noose and service in the ranks. One Morristown court sentenced 35 loyalists to hang. After the first two died, the rest enlisted. In a similar case, in 1779, all but two of the 75-man loyalist group joined up. It hardly needs adding that desertion of such unpromising troops was a constant problem throughout the war. I'm telling you this because I think we ought to know just how desperate New Jersey was and how, how far we had to go to win this terrible struggle. Throughout these trying years, Washington remained committed to his strategy of protracting the war and making sure New Jerseyans had an army to look the enemy in the face. When the British tried to advance across New Jersey in the summer of 1777 to assault Philadelphia, they found Washington and his Continentals on high ground in the center of the state waiting to pounce on them and refusing to come down from the hills to give all-out battle. A disgusted General William Howe abandoned the stunned loyalist of East Jersey and marched his men aboard ships to attack the American capital by landing on the northern shore of Chesapeake Bay. He might as well have gone by way of the Panama Canal. It took so long. And New Jersey, of course, during this time, survived. They had a, had a period of peace. Howe captured Philadelphia, however, and the proximity of the British Army emboldened numerous, numerous loyalists in West Jersey to join the war. Guerrilla clashes raged in that part of the state throughout the winter of 1777-78. And after that, the shooting war in New Jersey reached a climax in the Battle of Monmouth, where Washington's regulars slugged it out with the British Army that had occupied Philadelphia and was now retreating back to New York after learning that France had joined the war on America's side. Not often mentioned in this chapter of our story is the role of the New Jersey militia who skirmished boldly on the British flanks before and after the big battle. The militia managed to give a lot of people the impression that the Redcoats were fleeing from Philadelphia before the triumphant Americans. One of their own kind was convinced. German Captain Johann Ewald, who was in command of a company of riflemen 
and a very good soldier, I might add, wrote in his diary, the whole province is in arms. Each step costs human blood. I mean, each step for his men. Washington sent his congratulations to the New Jersey militia by the time the, the, the British Army staggered back to New York. He estimated they had killed or wounded more than 2,000 enemy soldiers during the British retreat. But, another but, the French alliance soon proved a disappointment, and guerrilla raids continued to ravage New Jersey. For Washington, the state remained what historians have called the cockpit of the revolution. In three of the five years of the war, after 1777, he made his winter quarters in, the, in New Jersey. In the other two years, which he spent at Valley Forge and at Newburgh in New York, he was never more than a day's march away. The first payoff of Washington's strategy came in June 1780, when the British, buoyed by the capture of Charleston, South Carolina, launched a knockout blow at Washington's army in Morristown. Swarms of New Jersey militia turned out to join 3,500 Continentals in stopping the 7,000-man enemy army. After two bloody collisions at Connecticut Farms and Springfield, the battered British withdrew. One of Washington's officers, praising the militia's performance in this battle, said it was Lexington repeated. Of course, he was from New England. <laughs> but that was a tremendous compliment, nonetheless, and I wouldn't repeat it if, if, if that wasn't the case. The book that I wrote about this encounter, The Forgotten Victory, was one of my most deeply personal experiences as a New Jerseyan writing history. After the battle, one of the militia's commanders, Colonel Sylvanus Seeley, sent this message to his men. The colonel takes the greatest pleasure in acknowledging that the troops under his command have lived in the greatest harmony that any ever did. If another crisis occurred, the colonel said he was sure that they would again convince the enemies of the United States that we mean to live and die like brothers and go hand in hand in supporting our country against its oppressors. By the time I finished typing those words, my eyes were too full of tears to see the page. Another forgotten aspect of this struggle is the role women play. They were as exposed as the men to the terror of midnight guerrillas. They were frequently forced to confront British regulars in their homes and barns. Too often, these intruders did not conduct themselves as gentlemen. Perhaps the best of the women's stories is the cool courage displayed by Susan Livingston, the governor's daughter, when the British raided their home, Liberty Hall, in Elizabeth. The governor, of course, was elsewhere. Susan and her sisters and mother were without any male protection. Yet she coolly stepped in front of a British officer who was about to open a chest containing vital documents about the state's rebel government. Sir, she said, if you leave the contents of that chest untouched, I will give you my father's personal papers. The implication, of course, that this was the, the chest was full of her love letters. The officer suddenly remembered he was a gentleman and agreed. <laughs> Susan led him and his men to a bookshelf and handed them dozens of her father's old law briefs from New York State. <laughs> the, briefful, the gleeful British stuffed them in their forage bags without reading them. Not until they got back to Staten Island did they realize they'd been gold. <laughs> when the war began, New Jersey did not have a newspaper. Everyone read papers from Philadelphia and New York. When the British occupied New York and more briefly Philadelphia, they made sure all these papers were crammed with loyalist propaganda. As further proof of the importance of New Jersey in his mind, Washington ordered a printer turned artilleryman named Shepard Collin to start publishing the New Jersey Journal in Chatham. He was, you won't be surprised to hear, a fiery spokesman for the American cause. In the ebb and flow of what Washington occasionally called this desultory war, the commander-in-chief made it clear that his strategy of protracting the conflict was an awful way to keep the British on the defensive while waiting for a chance to strike a knockout blow. The ultimate vindication of this strategy came 
in September 1781 when Washington joined his Continentals with the French Expeditionary Force and headed for Yorktown, Virginia to trap a British army under General Lord Cornwallis. Strung out in a long, vulnerable line as they marched through New Jersey, the Allied army was a ripe target for a surprise attack. Benedict Arnold, recently become a British Brigadier General, begged the British commander in New York, Sir Henry Clinton, to give him 6,000 men. He guaranteed he would destroy Washington and his army. General Clinton refused him. He said he feared to arouse the bold, persevering militia of that popular state. That's the greatest compliment that New Jersey got in the war from a British general. Washington and his French allies marched to the victory that won the war. General Clinton's words make it clear that the roots of that final victory can be found in the American experience here at Princeton, where the American army proved to themselves and the civilians read militia of New Jersey that they could defeat British regulars in face-to-face -face battle. When we trace these roots through the tangled struggle of the next five years, we realize how New Jersey earned its title of the cockpit of the revolution. Our soldiers fought no less than 238 battles on New Jersey's soil, more than any other state in the American Union. Those awesome numbers also make it clear that we 21st century Americans have an unmistakable obligation to resist the Institute of Advanced Studies plan to mutilate the Princeton battlefield. The similarity of the Institute's stance to the arrogance and condescension that the British repeatedly displayed during the Revolution is an additional motive that should inspire anyone and everyone in New Jersey to rally to this cause of the same commitment that, aspired, that inspired Samuel Seeley's militiamen. A determination to go hand in hand as brothers and sisters in spirit until we defeat another oppressive enemy. Let's make our slogan the cry at the Battle of Princeton awoke in every American and especially New Jersey heart, independence forever. Thank you very much. It's been my understanding that the American Revolution was one of the few wars in which the, act, the average soldier returned home to a situation better than he left it. What do you think, right or wrong? Uh, definitely wrong, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> it was better in, in, from a political point of view. He was now uh, a free man uh, and living in a free country. That's a very, very large uh, uh, achievement. There's no doubt about that. But the, the cost of the war was, was staggering. You know, so many uh, cities and towns were ravaged, particularly along the Atlantic coast. Uh, Connecticut, for instance, it's a state which I know pretty well because I spent some time in it these, uh, recently. And uh, uh, the, the British fleet came up and down Long Island Sound just burning one town after another. If you came home to th that sort of thing, you weren't thrilled. That's all there was to it. And on the frontier, the British did a lot of very nasty things, you know, arming the Indians and, and the, uh, so the people out in the western part of, uh, of, of uh, the American colonies or the American states uh, also had a very tough time. So it, it, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a break-even deal. They, they were far, far better politically, but the war economically uh, did not uh, uh, make them richer or, or necessarily uh, more pleased with their surroundings and so forth and so forth. It, it was it, the opposite for an awful lot of people. Yes. Yes, there's a gentleman in the back, or a lady. Yeah. In the red. Hi. Um, you, you made an impassioned point as to how the Battle of Princeton was more important than the Battle of Trent. Yes. Um, on the morning of January 3rd, wasn't it Washington's intention to get to New Brunswick? And why would he? It was Washington's intention to what? Get to, get to, New New to, get to the supplies in New Brunswick. Uh, he, did, he did have that as a possibility, yes. But 
uh, after the Battle of Princeton, his men had been up all night, they had no sleep, not much food, and there was a point as they were marching out of Princeton after the victory, you know, with prisoners and um, lots of loot and what have you, uh, that there was a road that led to New Brunswick and another road that led to Morristown. And he had to make a decision there. He did, have, so it proved that it was on his mind, it could continue. In fact, there's a quote, I, uh, which I can't recite offhand, uh, in which he described how if he could have gotten to New Brunswick, he not only could have uh, uh, shaken the British grip on New Jersey, but he would have seized their war chest, all their money that they had in New Brunswick to pay the soldiers, and just possibly the loss would have been so staggering to the British, they might have quit the war. Hey, that's not, they never would have done any such thing. But uh, this was what was on his mind, that's true. But he didn't do it, instead he proceeded on to Morristown. And, uh, and that's when the British then frantically marched on to New Brunswick and, and, and thought that he was going to continue on to New Brunswick. But as they sat there behind their fortifications, it dawned on them that they'd been completely bamboozled by Washington and his men. So I, I think uh, that's the best answer I can give you to that. Okay. I have a follow-up. We'll let other people go and if there's time. I'll, 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 I, I didn't hear you. What? He'll, he'll ask another question later. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this gentleman, uh, this very important gentleman, General Washington. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Fleming, after the battles of Long Island, yes. Washington retreated to Brooklyn Heights, Yes. And then he crossed over Manhattan, over the East River into Manhattan. Correct, yes. Could you give me your thoughts of what you think about that happening and how important Colonel Glover was to getting him across the East River? Yes, yes. This was a, a, a tremendous crisis. Uh, Washington's men had basically been routed by the British in, in the Battle of Long Island, or these days we call it the Battle of Brooklyn. Uh, it was a lot of it did play, take place in, in the so-called Heights of Guan, which were uh, uh, on the, they're inside of Brooklyn today. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and he outflanked all the Americans in these, on these heights, and they just had to run for their lives. And uh, the British outflanked them, you know. And so they all went back to these forts that they had as a fallback. And they were trapped there. The whole British Army was out there. And here, I may add, we were rescued by the memories of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Sir William Howe uh, uh, was the commander at Bunker Hill. And he never forgot or never got over the terrible slaughter that was inflicted on his men when he ordered a frontal assault. So when instead of charging Washington's shaken men, who they, they were very uncertain of what was going to happen next, he didn't. Instead, he, oh, he, did, he began what he called regular approaches, which meant it was a siege. They dug trenches this way, and then they dug a trench that way, and so forth, and they inched closer and closer to the American fortifications, and then would come a moment when there would be a mad rush. Uh, you know, they were close enough to, to, uh, to, to overwhelm them with only maybe one round uh, of, of, uh, of musket fire. But this was the moment when Washington realized he had to get his men out of there. And there was the East River between him and Manhattan. And he found that he had a rescuer named Glover, a New Englander whose whale boatman, who had a, a ability to, to handle small boats uh, that very other, few other Americans did. And they supplied a lot of the men uh, and, and, uh, and also the boats that enabled him during the night to slowly take his whole army out of there and, uh, and, and, and get them uh, back to Manhattan. It was, it was the, the, the most, uh, shall we say, tense, certainly one of the most tense moments in the history of the American Revolution because if the British had found out he was doing it, he was taking one regiment after another out of these forts and putting them on these boats. And, uh, and uh, so that, that, that uh, is a, 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 uh, a, a, shall we say, a, 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 a marvelous example of the resources of America, unexpected resources that you, you wouldn't expect to find in a situation like that. But there's another aspect of that, of that uh, I guess you'd call it, uh, defeat that was turned into victory. Uh, and, and that is, 
the, the fact that General Lord Howe was convinced that uh, if the, if the if British allowed, he, he was the admiral a, 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 of the British fleet, the brother of the British general, he was convinced that uh, if, if, we, if they allowed the army to escape, or Washington to escape, they could a agree to a truce and then a negotiate a peace. And th this is why I call my book 1776 Year of Illusions, plural. The British had these illusions too. The Howes particularly thought they could, they could pull this off, just beat the Americans just badly enough to get them to agree to surrender. And uh, because I, I, in my book, 1776 Year of Illusions, I tell how even a couple of British sloops, just small boats with a couple of cannon on them, could have sailed in the midst of this rowboat navy that was taking these men across the East River and caused utter havoc. And G General Howe, uh, Admiral Howe rather, had dozens of these uh, 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 little ships in his fleet. He never ordered one of them to go in there. And so it, 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 that's another complication I guess we have to thank God for. There, there, there were many, many black men in Washington's army, yes. Uh, he, he began enlisting uh, black men in the army. Uh, in, uh, in, in 1775, in defiance of the Continental Congress, incidentally. The Southerners in Congress had a fit when they found out he was doing it, but he ignored them. And he, he enlisted a lot of the black soldiers who fought at Bunker Hill into the army and, and encouraged uh, other officers to enlist black men. And by the time the year 1780, we reached the year 1780, four years later, one in every seven men in Washington's Continental Army was black. That's a little known fact, but that's tr it's, a tr it's very true. Uh, Washington was not in favor of slavery. He, he changed, uh, uh, there are many reasons why he changed his mind, but that one of them is the fact that these black men were willing to fight for their freedom. And that changed his mind about slavery. He didn't think that, he, the, he thought the quicker we got rid of slavery, the better. And he said it at least 100 times before he died. My second question is, in this day and age, we talk about the collateral damage, the civilians. So during this war, the British would won, what would happen to the people who were patriotic to uh, colonial army? And when the colonial army won, what would happen to people who were loyal to British army? What did you say? You're saying about collateral damage? Yeah, I know. But what, what is he saying? That Americans inflicted as much collateral damage as the British? Right, vice versa. They did sometimes. War is a messy business. You, 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 you've got to do terrible damage. To th what do you think we're doing over there in the Middle East right now, bombing the living daylights out of those people? We're killing a lot of civilians, there's no doubt about it. it, it, it it's, it, it's very sad uh, to, uh, to see how hard it is to win a war, it really is. Uh, the, I, I, have, I wrote a book called uh, uh, the FDR, uh, the, the, the New Deal is War, FDR, and the war within World War II. And it tells how, the, at one point in this book, it tells how the American Air Force came to Roosevelt and said, we refuse to go along with the British who are into area bombing. They just sent a thousand planes over Hamburg, for instance, and bombed the living daylights out of, daylights is only the word, but they, they destroyed the city. They, they killed, the British killed 90,000 people and innocent civilians in, in Hamburg in two days. And the Americans had, a, had a, another strategy in their air force. They, were, they went for pinpoint bombing, but the British wanted us to go for area bombing just like them and absolutely obliterate various German cities. And the, the American general, Air Force generals, were refusing to do it. They said, no, I'll, I'll resign rather than do that. And it was sent up the line to President Roosevelt. And he made the very, very, very difficult decision that we would do area bombing. So uh, th th it shows how hard it is to win wars. Just a question, I hear different dates so often given, but when did the British forces actually evacuate New York City? When was the last date we could say that you had British power in New York? So what I'm asking. They, they evacuated New York in uh, November eight, uh, of 1783. And for, 
for decades and decades and decades, up to World War I, New York celebrated Evacuation Day. Uh, and, uh, but only when we got into a war on which the British were our, our allies, Woodrow Wilson decided this was not in good taste. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> Listen, during World War I, uh, I once wrote a long essay on, on uh, Wilson's censorship during World War I. There was a, 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 a Jewish producer in Hollywood who, wrote a, a, who did a very good movie on the American Revolution in which he showed British soldiers fiendishly bayoneting Americans as they were defeated on a battlefield and so forth and so forth. And uh, Wilson, not he, Wilson personally, but Wilson's uh, uh, apparatchiks, they had this man arrested for uh, uh, slandering America's ally, Great Britain. And he got nine years in jail, this poor guy. When the war ended, he was still in jail. And after that, you couldn't buy, get anybody in Hollywood to do a movie about the American Revolution. <laughs> it's true. That's why it's, one of the reasons why there's been so few war movies about the American Revolution. That, that uh, example convinced an awful lot of people in Hollywood that it was just too complicated for them to deal with. Yes. I, have yes, a, I have a two-parter. Uh, yes, sir. Um, first of all, um, how was it that Cornwallis slept uh, while Washington crossed the Delaware? He didn't hear anything or he told people his uh, sentries not to bother him? What was the deal? Uh, they thought there was overconfidence. Washington. Uh, 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 Cornwallis's men had marched across the state, you know, they were pretty tired. They, if they had attacked, they would have driven Washington into the Delaware. But instead, Washington was behind fortifications and so forth. And so Cornwallis was quoted as saying, we'll bag the fox tomorrow. Notice the uh, fox hunting metaphor again yeah. in, in the British upper classes. And uh, well, uh, Washington, they, after, 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 Princeton, they, they started calling Washington the fox, but it was a compliment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and he, so we left some militia building fires in front of uh, the, the, the fortifications they had outside of Trenton and convinced uh, the British that that's, the whole American army was there. The whole American army, meanwhile, was, uh, was marching down uh, well marked, they had maps and so forth, uh, well uh, known, uh, 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 Roads to Princeton, and, and where, where they smashed the British, and so it, it really was a, a a remarkable performance on Washington's part. He, he was, you know, he he was a brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I once wrote an article for American Heritage called George Washington's Spymaster Extraordinary. He was an absolutely brilliant spymaster. He had he uh, turn has some of the stuff in it, you know, but they don't play it up in the right way, in my opinion. But he he had. A, a spies inside New York all over the place. And uh, there's a wonderful story. When the war ended and, and Washington, uh, the, the British were getting ready to evacuate and so forth, and Washington rode into New York with 700 men. And there was, a, there was an Irishman named Hercules Mulligan. And he palled around with the British officers. He was a big, jolly guy. They all loved him and so forth and so forth. He was picking up information, drinking with these guys, you know, and so forth. <laughs> And Washington was getting all this wonderful information. But everybody in New York thought Hercules Mulligan was a Tory, a traitor, a this and a that. And when the British evacuated, they couldn't wait to see the string them up or at least tar and feather them and so forth. But the first thing Washington did the morning after he arrived in New York is he got on his horse and he rode to Hercules Mulligan's shop and he went in and they could hear the clink of coins <laughs> as he was paying off Hercules Mulligan. And then they went out to France's tavern and had breakfast together. <laughs> that was a nice way of saving his neck. <laughs> yes, there's a joke. Wait, do I have a second part to my question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. What if Cornwallis had followed Washington towards uh, Morristown? He made the fatal decision to go to New Brunswick. He was, he, he, he was shaken, so badly shaken, that he thought Washington might be heading for, for New Brunswick. So he felt he double-timed all the way to New Brunswick and got there, he thought, ahead of Washington. And they were all behind their fortifications on New Brunswick, in New Brunswick. And meanwhile, Washington's army was settling in in Morristown. It was a complete uh, deception, you know, on Washington's part. 
So it's a. Uh, we have uh, one more. Yes, this, this, this is a. I was curious about the uh, Asgill affair and how that how Washington's decision to well I know he was ordered to let him go by Congress. Yes. Uh, how that affected feeling in New Jersey towards the loyalists and the rebels after. Yeah, well, we better world. explain the Asgill affair. You know, uh, uh, the there was a a loyalist raid in New Jersey, and and uh, they captured a, a, a an American captain and they hanged him, and. Uh, it, it was, you know, prisoner of war. You just couldn't do that. And he was in a little fort on near on in Tom near Tom's River, and uh, so uh, the, the Congress and everybody else was screaming. We had to get some revenge. So uh, Washington selected by uh, uh, lottery a British officer that they had captured. Well, you know, a lot of British officers. A guy named Captain Asgill, and. Uh, and he was going to hang unless they surrendered the guys who hanged the New Jersey captain. And uh, it, it looked very tense for a while. And then uh, the, uh, somebody got to uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the captain's mother, that's it, the captain Askill's mother, got to somebody very high in the French government and asked him to intervene to save her son. He was her only son and so forth. And suddenly the whole, uh, I guess, the balance of the, of the fair shifted and, and Washington decided he, he couldn't hang this, this young man. He, was, he had nothing to do with the original crime. And so, uh, because the war was over and basically won at this point, he thought it would be the better part of valor to just forget the whole thing and forgive Askell and let him go home to his mother. Yes, one more. This is a... Who was the Hessian commander Captain Rawl. I, I mean, not captain. He was a he was a colonel, Colonel Rawl, R A R R A L L. He was a very very successful soldier. He distinguished himself in the attack on Fort Washington, uh, up on the Hudson, uh, and he, he he was a highly regarded uh, uh, man. There's no doubt about it. But again, he, I think he was deceived by Washington, the absolute miraculous. A manipulator of uh, deceptions and so forth. Uh, Rawls had no idea that Washington was going to come after him. Uh, he, he had, he, Washington had sent information through various people across the Delaware to port, at portraying his army as just disintegrating. They had no food, no money, no shoes, and, and it was just a question of waiting for them to fall apart and, and a few of them might surrender and the rest could just flee into the western woods. That's what uh, Rawl believed. And, and, but he got all this, Rawl got all this from information that Washington had sent to him <laughs> through, through various uh, people who pretended to be loyalists and that sort of thing. It was, it was a masterful performance, it really was. And it worked perfectly, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions or want to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, please come forward. He's